Now that we learn regret is a powerful tool, is there a way now we can make it more effective to give us those life lessons? That's what we'll talk about today. The past is a great place. I don't want to erase it or regret it, but I don't want to be its prisoner either. Mick Jagger. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about the book, The Power of Regret by Daniel H. Pink. We talked last time about how this book teaches us that regret is an important part for us to learn how to do better, have better experiences, but then also learn what not to do or learn to take those big steps. So today we're going to talk about fine-tuning that regret to make it even more powerful for us as a tool. The first step that we can use to make regret more powerful for us is to remember that while we can't undo the things we've done in our lives, we can not correct it. We can go back. We can apologize. We can even make amends. We can help the people that if we harm someone, get on with whatever it is we did to them. If we harmed ourselves, then we can also try to change those decisions so that we move on from it. We do better. We correct whatever harm we did to ourselves. Again, it's not about fixing the mistake because we can't go back in time, but we can at least do better for anyone that was harmed in our decision. I also think, too, that if it's something like spending money or gaining weight, we can at least stop doing that and start reversing course. See if we can cut back on spending money, see if we can cut back on our weight a little bit, whatever it is we did. Can we go backwards a little bit? Can I do it? But we can move forward. He says step two is at least it. For example, you would say something like, well, I didn't go on that giant trip to Europe, but at least I was able to fix my roof. I majored at college in something I should not have majored in, but at least I met my spouse there, or at least I learned life lessons that helped me get my jobs. If you can give an at least moment to all the regrets you're having, it'll help you get past it because there are benefits. Even if we've gone a wrong direction, there are benefits we have from doing that. And he said, quote, at least can turn regret into relief. He says that we want to take away that word, if only, if only I'd done this, or if only I hadn't done that. Instead, at least at least I was able to do something beneficial or something beneficial came from it. You can think about, he says too, it could have turned out worse. You know, for example, you took the vacation, you didn't get a chance to fix your roof, but again, you found a new job, you were able to get through and and pay for that roof to get repaired despite being low on money. And at least you were able to quickly pay that off when you got your new job. So you minimize the problem. Or the silver lining, did something benefit from it because this happened? So complete the sentence, at least I, and then maybe it'll help you get over your regret a little bit better. He also talks about reframing. I talk about reframing a lot too. I think reframing is one of the most powerful things. And again, I thought it was weird. I thought that reframing issues was just more or less lying to yourself. I never became a person who was really involved in sports, but the extra time I had in high school, I got really into computers and it became my lifelong pursuit. So now I have regrets about not losing weight or getting into sports or doing something like that, but I extracted lessons from it and I minimized it, not giving the negative feelings and not deciding that you shouldn't have negative feelings, but instead you took what could be a negative feeling and realized There were good things that happened because of those decisions you made. He says it's important that you want to have self-disclosure, he calls it, which means not trying to throw it out of our mind, not trying to get rid of it, not trying to shove it in the corner or under the rug of our brain, because it can come back and haunt us if we do that. So we should allow it to live in our brains a little bit. Think about what we're trying to do. And then he says what we can do is write it down. We can talk about it with someone else, maybe even someone professionally, if we feel like we're never getting over it. And we could possibly apologize if it, again, was a regret that involved other people. So we could actually go through the process of trying to at least apologize or make amends for it. And then he says we have to have self-compassion. If we don't learn to forgive ourselves, even maybe after other people learn to forgive us, we're going to be sunk. 
you were going to have troubles that whole time. We have to have that compassion. And a good step in having compassion is pretend that a friend of yours is telling you this story of what you did. You would be there for them. You would tell them, it's okay. It'll be all right. You know, we made a mistake. Can you tell that to yourself? And have the same kind of compassion for yourself that you would have for other people if they told you that issue. He gives a step then that is called self-distancing, which he says is analyze and strategize. So when you have something that happened to you, can you look at it almost like a third person, almost like you were watching it on TV or again, a friend was telling you about it. And if you can give yourself a little distance from what it is that happened not be so raw about it, not beat yourself up about it, but kind of look at it more analytically, more so that you can just see what happened, what went wrong. And he gives the example of Julius Caesar, who had regrets when it came to the Gallic Wars. And what he would do is he would sort of distance himself by it by saying, well, Caesar did this, even though he was Caesar. But Making it in third person maybe helped him analyze it a little bit better instead of, well, I did this and I screwed up. People don't like that. But if I say, well, Jill went down the wrong path. She spent the money. She went to Europe and now she has a roof she can't afford. By making it more like a TV character or a book character or a third party character, we can look at it with a different set of eyes. Okay, fine. You you made a mistake. You blew a lot of money you didn't have to make. What can we do about it now? He also mentions, too, that you can imagine yourself in the future when this is no longer an issue. Do you think that when you made a mistake, when you're in your 50s or in your 60s, you're going to look back at this event and call it earth shattering like maybe you feel right now? Or are you going to look at it and go, that was a silly move I made, but you know what? In the end, I had some fun. I got over it and I figured out another way. You can see that the future you solve the problem doesn't care about it, and got over it. He says that self-distancing can help us within a matter of seconds. We start to feel better about the situation and we get better perspective about it. So again, we can analyze it, see what went right, what went wrong. Should I have done it? Or boy, that was kind of a stupid mistake. And then give yourself strategies. The next time this happens, I'm not going to do that. I kind of tend to be a nice person and I get overrun by vendors quite often. They say they're going to do something. They don't do something. And I'm like, hey, would it be nice if you did that thing you told me you were going to do? And then they don't. I tend to believe that if I was a nastier person, if I was a yeller, if I was threatening lawsuits, I'd probably get better attention at it. So then can I take those regrets of not being more forceful so that I can come up with decisions of how I can do better in the future? I've come up with some strategies. Some of them are kind of funny by basically making alternatives to helping me solve that problem a pain in the butt. Someone wasn't helping me on something. They owed me quite a bit of money. And okay, okay, I'll take care of it. Okay, okay, I'll take care of it. And I said, okay, can we get together and meet? Can we talk about how this went wrong? Can I get an analysis of where we didn't get the money straight in the first place? I mean, I made it like this very annoying list. The idea being that he would much rather just solve my problem and pay me the money his business owes me instead of me dragging him through hours of meetings just to explain to me what happened. So now my strategy of annoying someone in the nicest way possible got me what I was looking for. At least I hope so. So there are other strategies we can take away from a solution by having regrets. He quotes Tina Selig who is a Stanford professor, who says that we have to have what she calls a failure resume, which means it's this inventory of things that went wrong, didn't go our way. And by looking at the failure resume, we will be able to know what lessons we learned. You know, sometimes it's easy to remember. Oh, I got walked on by my vendor and he never got me the thing I wanted to get. I mean, I can give you a laundry list of times where a landlord or a vendor, or someone who was doing some work on my house didn't do the thing they said they were going to do. And I was like, well, okay, I guess that's how it happened. But if I had had a failure resume, I would see that this happens to me over and over again. I'd start to see patterns, and I would start to be able to remember 
those strategies I came up with to overcome them. He says that we can take next year's resolutions for the new year and match them up with the regrets we have. So while we're looking back at the year and thinking of how it went and how it could have gone better, it could have gone worse, can we take those resolutions then and pair them to what our regrets are? You know, the next time I'm going to spell things out more clearly for my vendors and my expectations. I'm going to put it in writing and I'm going to do a better job of documenting the timeline so that when things go wrong, I can bring that forth to the vendor and show them, hey, it's been 15 months and you still haven't given me the thing I asked for. Maybe if I document the timelines better, learn my lessons, I can actually get more responses from the vendor and get things resolved more quickly. He says too, and this is kind of an interesting strategy, he says, can we take away positive events from our memories so that we can see that we're glad? So take example, the trip that we we took to Europe, we blew all our money, we didn't have money for our roof, now we're in trouble, and it took us a long time to be able to get the money together, got in debt, and it was a long time before I got to pay that off. If we take away any of the positives. Well, I got a new job. It did get better. I did pay the money. It ended up working out in the end. Take away that positive. You can see how really dark and gloomy this could have been. I could have defaulted on my credit cards. I could have had to go bankrupt. I mean, there's things that go wrong. The reason he says this, and this is where I had to read it a few times, is because then it gives us something to be grateful for, that none of those things happened. Sure, we had some struggles, but it was better better than we imagined it would be. He even brings up, it's a wonderful life. If we just saw the negative things, that's what the angel was essentially showing George, the negative stuff, he realized how grateful he was that none of those things happened, that he could go back and look at the things he does have with a heart of gratitude instead of regret. He says in the end, and you know I'm going to love this, is that we should have a journey mindset. That once we know we're on an adventure, we're going to have some ups, we're going to have some downs, we're going to go some right ways and some wrong ways. Once we know that, we're going to have less pressure on our lives to do the things that we think we should do, we don't do, do the things that we didn't do, that we should have done. We're an adventure. You know, it's just like on vacation. Sometimes things go right and some things go wrong. I remember once we went to Disney World and got tired of it. I don't know, too many people. And we decided to drive up the Florida coast. Happened. It was the day before the space shuttle was going up. And the day of the space shuttle going up, you can't get anywhere near the space shuttle. But the day before, you get to actually drive on the road that it was launching from way back when. And so we got to see it close up. I think we were a mile away. While if we had gone the next day, they would have been three miles away. So it ended up being really lucky that we just decided to do something other than Disney for a day. Could have regretted it. We paid good money for those tickets. But instead, we did something else and we had an amazing adventure. Once we think of life as an adventure, we will have less regrets. Or maybe we'll just have less feeling of regret or negative attitudes toward them because we're on an adventure. We're going to do something better. He says that even having too much anticipation of something going well can give us regrets, but it's sort of a false regret if I understand it correctly. And he gives the example of a lottery ticket. Or if you imagine that we think we're going to go on this great camping trip, and it's going to be amazing and wonderful and exciting, and then it ends up raining the whole time. And now it wasn't any of those things. We brought our anticipation up too high, which then caused us to be regretful that it didn't go well. Now we're sad. Now we're bummed out. And now we have regrets because we put it on such a high platform of this is going to be amazing. Maybe if we have more realistic thoughts about things when we go into it, life's an adventure and sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes it rains and sometimes it just doesn't go your way. Now that properly stored anticipation has a better place and causes us not to have regrets. And he says, too, that that anticipation can sometimes cause us to not make the right decision. Gives the example of a lottery ticket. What if we anticipated, oh, it's going to be so amazing. I'm going to win this lottery. And then you decide, I'm going to quit my job because when I win this lottery, it's going to be wonderful. 
Well, you probably not win the lottery, and now you just quit your job. So even a worst case is having too much anticipation for an event can actually make you decide things wrongly. That's probably a pretty extreme idea, but it can. He even says, sometimes you just go with your gut. What are you feeling inside? A lot of times that gut feeling is right. They always say that on the exams, right? Go with your first answer and just go with it. Don't start thinking about it and going back and changing answers. I don't know. I always had my doubts about that phrase. But that idea that we're just going to go with the first decision, sometimes it's the right decision. Sometimes our rethinking ideas is the wrong decision. So I don't know. I kind of like rethinking ideas. But he says it could cause us to have less regrets if we go with our first decision. And then he has something that he calls the regret optimization framework. That's where we can anticipate some of our regrets. Well, I'm going to go camping, but just keep in mind it could rain and it may be not as cool. So what if I had a contingency plan in case it did rain? Or what if we have better anticipation of what's going to happen so then we're not so sad when it does happen? We have more realistic viewpoints. Not having pre-regrets about something to the point we've made ourselves miserable. But instead, keeping it in that right balance of proper anticipation, maybe you're going to have some regrets, but I think he summarized it the perfect way by saying, life's an adventure. We're going to have some good times. We're going to have some bad times. That's just kind of how it goes. So he says his whole framework is to basically figure out how long in the future is it going to be before this regret doesn't even matter anymore? Or are there ways we can make it right? We talked about that. Or did we overanticipate and we're putting this regret in a more unhelpful way because we thought too much about it when we got started? And every day we make hundreds of decisions. We're going to get some of them wrong. And if we put it in perspective that we make hundreds of choices every day, some of them are going to be wrong. And that's just kind of how it goes. Having that proper perspective about we're going to make mistakes can help us too. He says that what we really need to do is satisfice. We did a whole podcast about that, meaning that we're going to maximize that decision and we're going to realize we have to be satisfactory about it too. We're not going to have everything go perfectly. And if we can be okay and happy about what happened or what didn't happen, we'll be happier. He says that we have to maximize on the most crucial decisions. So on the things that are the most important, Try to make the best decision possible and do a better job of building that decision with research, sound ideas, and then we can go into the future knowing we did the best we could. We gave this all the effort we really needed to. So my challenge to you, is there something that you have a regret in the past? Is there a way that you can make amends to yourself, to someone else? Can you at least apologize? Or can you put it in the proper framework if you did it to yourself? So that you understand at least this happened or at least I had this benefit happen because of that thing happening. See if that helps put regret into a proper place. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast and now the YouTube channel. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. And I'm happy to answer your emails. If you have a problem and you're stuck in life, happy to do a book that would address those problems. And remember, our way through the world by maximizing the lessons we've learned starts with small steps.